Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Hello and good afternoon to everyone on the West Coast and the East Coast, where our guest, Jonathan Greenblatt, head of the Anti-Defamation League, joins the Commonwealth Club to discuss his new book, It Could Happen Here, Why America is Tipping from Hate to the Unthinkable and How We Can Stop It. My name is Roger McNamee, and I'm pleased to be the moderator for today's program. I'm a tech investor, and over the past five years, I've become an advocate for reigning in the power of social media companies, such as Facebook, Twitter, and Google. One of the reasons I have become so passionate to reform technology is that social media has become, quite honestly, a cesspool of hate, racism, anti-Semitism, homophobia, and more. These companies have allowed hateful content to permeate the mainstream in a way that those of us who were involved could never have imagined in the early years. It's our guest today, Jonathan Greenblatt's job to fight this hatred from his position as the head of the ADL. This is what he does every day. Jonathan, welcome to the Commonwealth Club for today's conversation. Roger, now, thank you for having me. My pleasure. An important housekeeping tip before we get started with Jonathan. If you have questions for Jonathan, please put them in the Zoom chat. Questions posted there will be forwarded to me throughout the program, and hopefully we'll get to answer most of them. So Jonathan, your book has the most provocative title. It could happen here. Why America's tipping from hate to the unthinkable and how we can stop it. Tell me what you're talking about and how we got here. Sure. Well, first of all, let me thank you again, Roger, for having this conversation with me in the Commonwealth Club for convening it. It's such a terrific institution, I think has really contributed to the public conversation over the years. So it's proud to be a part of it here today. So I wrote this book, It Could Happen Here, based on my vantage point as the CEO of the ADL, where over the past six years, we've seen kind of not just a decay, but a rapid deterioration I think in kind of civic society to the point where, you know, we are the oldest anti-hate group in America. We've been fighting these battles against bigotry for well over a hundred years, but my colleagues and I at ADL have really never quite seen a moment like this. I think we're at a precarious point and I think we ignore it at our own peril. So in part, based on what I've seen in the last six years, uh, that prompted me to write the book. But to be frank, Roger, the book's also very personal. I mean, I'm the grandson of a Holocaust survivor from Germany. My grandfather, he and his Jewish family, Germany was the only country they had ever known. My great-grandfather fought in World War I for Germany. And he never could have imagined when he was a young man that, again, the, his homeland would literally turn on him regard him as an enemy of the state, destroy everything that he ever loved, and slaughter his almost his entire family and friends. And I also come at this work as, this, as the husband of a woman who came to the United States as a political refugee from Iran. My wife, also Jewish, and her family traced their lineage back they would tell you thousands of years to the Babylonian exile. And when my wife was a young person, she never would have imagined that the only country she had ever known would one day turn on her, regard her as an enemy of the state, destroy everything that she ever loved, and force her and her family to flee. Now, my grandfather came to this country, you know, at the, like in 1938, 39. My wife came to this country in 1988, 89. So there's 50 years between them. And yet they both faced a reality where pluralistic, sophisticated, 
westernized countries, countries that believed in science, countries that respected uh, democratic traditions, countries that were seen as the pinnacle of their kind of continental civilizations, both unraveled, one because of the rise of the Third Reich, one because of the advent of the Islamic Revolution. So the cultural and socio-political circumstances were different, but the end result was the same. The unraveling of society as they knew it, the total unmooring of that country from the norms that had governed it for so long. And what resulted uh, was the expulsion of the Jewish minority, the persecution, expulsion, extermination of the Jewish minority, and it augured far worse. And so I think as we sit here today, much as my grandfather never would have guessed that his, when he was a young man, that his grandchildren, me, my brother and my cousins, would be born in America, much as my say, father-in-law never would have imagined when he was a young man that his children, his grandchildren, my kids, and my nieces and nephews would be born in this country. I don't think I can take for granted that my God-willing grandchildren one day will be born here in America. I just think my own history informs me of that. And then you look at some of the warning signs we've seen in the past half decade from the rise of anti-Semitism and hate crimes, which we can drill down on, to the, to the sort of amplification of extremism and dogma, which has worsened dramatically in just the past few years, to literally the advent of authoritarianism on our own shores. Now, America has always been an imperfect country. Hate didn't start, say, with Donald Trump. It's a country that was founded in many ways on the extermination of the indigenous people who once occupied this land and the enslavement of African people, a painful race, legacy of racism that remains today. But despite those historical antecedents, and again, I think you can look at almost any country, modern country in history and find troublesome antecedents. There are simply a set of factors in motion today which are alarming at best <laughs> and terrifying at worst. And I think if we don't act now, if we don't engage today, again, there's no natural law which dictates that this democracy as we know it will persist and prevail. There's no kind of you know, foregone conclusion that the center of of democracy in the world, a light into the nations for almost 250 years will continue to blaze bright if we don't engage and act now. So Jonathan, the thing you're describing in your personal experience, right, is very specifically driven by religion. I think in reading the book though, I took away from it that there are more kinds of hate going on here That's than right. just religious hate. And that part of what makes the current U.S. situation so difficult is that so many people, so many groups are being targeted at the same time. Tell us about that. Yeah. I mean, I think you're right to point that out in, in uh, general as we relate to the United States. I would say anti-Semitism or hatred against the Jews. For some, it is a hate against the Jewish religion, and it is, again, faith-based. For some, it's a hatred against the Jewish people. And it's ethnic based. For some today, it's a hatred against the Jewish state and it's politically based. But all of it speaks to a kind of othering, right? All of it speaks to is regarding the Jews as a distinct minority and marginalizing them, both through culture, sometimes de facto, and sometimes de jure through the law. Today in America, we've seen the process of otherization happen to different communities. I mean, it's interesting, Roger, for me, the timing when I started at ADL in the summer of 2015 was the same week that Donald Trump announced his candidacy. And literally, he descended down that gilded escalator at Trump Tower, Trump Plaza in Manhattan, and immediately started talking about Muslims, 
and Mexicans. The Mexicans coming across the border were rapists and murderers or criminals, whatever lunatic thing that he said. And I remember this really hit me like a bucket of cold water in the face because, you know, I've spent the better past of the last 20 years in California, Southern California, where many of my friends were Mexican or Mexican-American. And I mean, to say these things, I found really stunning. I mean, it's just not true. There's not even a scintilla of truth to it. But what Donald Trump did um, really shouldn't surprise us. He had spent years not only finding his place kind of in the public eye around his the celebrity of The Apprentice and his kind of faux real estate success, but also around his kind of, um, you know, his embrace of the birther movement. This idea that President Barack Obama was a Muslim person originally born in Kenya. Obviously, it was lunatic, not a shred of truth to it whatsoever. But Donald Trump used that and preyed upon people's sort of uncertainty and really used the megaphone of his own celebrity to magnify that dramatically, right? And so he used that otherization around Barack Obama to suggest again that we should be afraid of foreigners and Muslims. And he took that to the next level as a candidate, and then he made it law as president with his effort to enshrine the Muslim ban into a literal, you know, he did that through executive order or his effort to build a wall at the, at the border. Now, look, I say that as someone who believes in secure borders, everyone does. Everyone believes in secure borders. But the idea that somehow people from Mexico are some sinister force seeking to imperil our country is just, it's not ludicrous. That understates it, Roger. It's dangerous and it's racist at the core and it's evocative. And this, I think, may be some of the nub of your question. It's evocative of the white supremacist tenet of the great replacement theory, right? This is fundamental to understanding the white nationalism that it seems to be exploding across the United States, which is founded in large part on this idea that somehow the white race, as if that were such a thing, but the white race is being um, undermined with intention by some plot, of course, put together by the Jews, to flood the country with non-whites, particularly Mexicans and Muslims, let alone other people who they consider subhuman. So this is this really dangerous idea that had been pinging around white supremacist circles for a long time, that President Trump and his acolytes like Steve Bannon and whatnot really ushered them from the margins into the mainstream, and we're all still dealing with the consequences of that today. So as I think about the rise of extremism the, this dangerous force, there's no question that it was welcomed and again, given a kind of license by President Trump it didn't have before. I mean, there are other forces that concern me as well. There's a kind of illiberalism from the far left, but it has been far less militant, far less murderous. And so we have to hold these things in some degree of sanity if we want to try to challenge this wave before it washes over all of us. So one of the things that I found absolutely fantastic about the book is the way you take the 100 plus year history of the ADL and the timeline of the struggle to provide security and rights to everyone. And you lay on our current predicament on top of that. Can you walk our audience through the timeline of the current predicament, because this didn't start with Trump. You make that point very clearly that there are lots of historical elements in here that we've been building towards this moment. And give us a little bit of that. Yeah. Well, so look, first, I'll give you some background on ADL to kind of give the context. So ADL is indeed the oldest anti-hate group in America. It was founded in 1913 after a Jewish man was lynched outside of Atlanta. Very famous case, the Leo Frank case. This is a young man who came from New York down to Georgia to manage a family business, a pencil factory. And at the time, there was what we would characterize today in our current kind of vernacular, systemic discrimination facing Jews in this country. Jews couldn't live in many places. You know, There were legal contracts that prevented people from selling their homes to Jews. Quotas kept them out of universities. Those were legal. There was a set of cultural practices that kept Jews out of many professions. 
Jews couldn't get health care at institu many institutions. That's why so many hospitals today, Roger, still bear names like, you know, Mount Sinai or, or, or Israel or Beth Israel. Jews founded their own health care institutions in order to get treatment. And of course, there was widespread defamation of Jews in the media. And so into this environment, this man, Leo Frank, went down to Georgia to manage the family business. Uh, a young girl was found sexually assaulted and strangled to death at the pencil factory that he managed. And immediately they blamed the Jew, even though there was exculpatory evidence he had not committed the crime. But Roger, he was wrongfully convicted, sentenced to death. And then the governor intervened and commuted his sentence from you know, execution to life imprisonment because he hadn't had due process. And the mob was so enraged by that act of leniency, they tore Leo Frank from his jail cell and they hung him from a tree. And they hung him from a tree. And while his body was still swinging from the rope, they barbecued underneath the tree. They had a whole town came together and did a kind of a big public event. They took photographs of the corpse and turned those into postcards and gave them out as souvenirs. It was an ugly, ugly moment in American history. And yet, while many, unfortunately, you know, boys and men of color, black boys and men, were murdered this way over the years, it was the first time a Jewish person had been, you know, publicly executed in this manner. And it prompted a set of Jewish individuals say, we need to do something about this. We need to stop it. And so they came together and created this organization, the Anti-Defamation League. And they wrote a charter for their new organization. We would probably call it a manifesto in today's vernacular. And in it are the words that we still use 100 plus years later as our mission statement. The founders wrote that this organization's purpose would be to, quote, stop the defamation of the Jewish people and secure justice and fair treatment to all. So it's so interesting about that, Roger, is at a time when, you know, in 1913, the Jews didn't have any political power in this country, no economic resources to speak of, no cultural capital or social standing. This individual's starting an organization to fight for the Jews made a lot of sense because they were so weak and vulnerable. But then to say, we will fight for the Jews and we will fight for others. That was, you know, to, to kind of paraphrase Jim Collins, a bold, hairy, and audacious goal, right? They had no, didn't have a leg to stand on for themselves. And it was a, not just a courageous claim, it was a crazy claim, we'll fight for others. And yet that dual approach of realizing that the Jews can only be safe if everyone is safe, that motivated this organization for the better part of 100 years. So the ADL fought to make America better for its Jews. Literally, they turned over those laws that prevented Jews from buying homes. They exposed the quotas that prevented Jews from attending universities. They, uh, you know, they broke open the cultural practices. They started calling out the defamation in the media. ADL did all of that, made America a safer place for its Jews. And starting in the 1940s, fought for the civil rights movement. In the 1950s, fought to open up America's doors to immigrants. In the 1960s, was part of, you know, marching in Selma and fighting for black equality. In the 80s, starting to fight for LGBT equality, LGBTQ equality, and the list goes on. And so ADL has been, through advocacy and education, at the forefront of understanding and tracking hate crimes in this country. And there are these things that we've seen in recent years that just don't have a precedent. So start, for example, with anti-Semitism, Roger. We've been tracking anti-Semitic incidents in America since the 1970s, since before there were even hate crimes laws. And I know that because ADL helped to write the hate crimes laws and get them passed in these United States. So literally, we were on a decline of anti-Semitic incidents from 2001 to 2015. I'm talking about acts of harassment, vandalism, and violence. Literally, they were going down, 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 down. And then in 2016, coincident with Donald Trump's running for president and him getting the nomination, the number spiked 34% year over year. So again, we have 26 field offices collecting this data every year, every month, every week, every day, reported to us by police departments, by victims, et cetera. We investigate every incident that we report. And so after a 15-year decline, it went up 34% in 16. In 2017, the number spiked 57%. 
That's the highest increase we've ever seen year over year. In 2018, the number dipped slightly, 5%, but that was the year of the massacre in Pittsburgh, okay? The most violent anti-Semitic act in American history. In 2019, the number leapt up again, 12%. That was the highest total we've ever recorded. And then in 2020, the year when everything closed because of COVID, when businesses were shuttered and people were socially distancing, the number dipped just 4%. It was still the third highest total we've ever seen. So we're still tabulating the 2021 numbers, but the increase in anti-Semitism, it is literally the canary in the coal mine. It's the indicator of a problem. And then if you say, well, why is it going up and why is hate going up across the board? I think there are a couple factors that are really driving it that are different from ADL's perspective than other moments we've seen in history. So first, I think, is the weaponization of hate as a political tool. So again, there has always been prejudice in our politics. But LBJ, you know, presciently declared in 1964 when he signed the Civil Rights Act that, you know, the Democrats had lost the South for a generation. But he almost understated it because when that happened, the South, you know, that was still so many parties were still upset, particularly the white elite Southern majority about the, uh, the kind of legal removal of Jim Crow, if you will, that they since then have been working to undermine in so many ways the legitimacy of that decision. And we've seen law after law, case after case that goes up to the Supreme Court, which continue to try to chip away at the effort to provide civil rights and voting rights and enfranchise African-Americans in this democratic experiment. And I think one of the strategies that's been used very effectively is to demonize not just black people, but the government itself that bestowed upon them rights. And so you've seen this. There was skepticism after the Watergate situation in the 70s, but Ronald Reagan made government the enemy. Newt Gingrich, also, by the way, from the metro Atlanta area, really perfected this, this call that it was, again, the federal government. That was the enemy. And when he became Speaker of the House, he cemented that idea into law and worked to dismantle the administrative state, a cause that Steve Bannon has embraced with relish. Steve Bannon's literally been open and candid about the fact that his goal is to dismantle the administrative state. So in many ways, one of the things that the, uh, the uh, revanchist right has done is say the government, which again granted rights to all, is the enemy itself, calling into question the legitimacy of all their decisions. So that's number one, and that's been a big factor. I think number two has been the normalization of extremism. Now, again, the John Birch Society, the KKK, I mean, these anti, these sort of call them pro white, um, these pro white. Militia types have always been out there, but they gained even greater legitimacy after the return of veterans from Vietnam, the Vietnam War, and then the first Gulf War, as some you know, writers like Kathleen Ballou from Chicago have written about, where you had this veteran class who came back and didn't get all of the, you know, I think society did not embrace them and didn't give them all the respect that they deserved. So you had this, this kind of angry class of people. Factor on to that some of the symbols from the early 90s, where again, you had Bill Clinton who won. And again, he was held out as if he was somehow a traitor to his race. You had the Branch Davidian siege at Waco in 93, the Oklahoma bombing, the Oklahoma bombing, short, the federal, the, the, the bombing in Oklahoma City shortly thereafter. And those two events really cemented in mind, you know, the idea that people from, um, the people who died in Waco to Timothy McVeigh were somehow martyrs to a greater cause, right, against the jackbooted federal thugs. And so this extremism became normalized because, honestly, whereas the government moved on a dime to dismantle and take on the challenge of Islamic extremism after 2001, that didn't happen after the Oklahoma City bombing at all. And in fact, you had extremists who became, again, somewhat normalized that we just needed to accept that they were a fringe that we needed to realize were just always going to be there, even though that wasn't the case at all. And we had the growth then of the sovereign citizens movement. And again, the advent of more armed militia groups who capitalized on Second Amendment fears to cement their own sort of power. So number one, 
you had, uh, I would say, the government as the federal government as the enemy. Number two, the normalization of extremism. Number three, you've had a hardening of the have and have nots gap that has really calcified. And many have written about the effect of globalization, expanding the gap between the 1% and the rest of the population. And the sense that you know, those jobs are going away and the federal government and other elected officials weren't really listening to the needs of so many. And that lent the, that created a fertile ground for the kind of scapegoating that people like Alex Jones and others capitalized on. And then finally, as you and I have talked about for countless hours, the rise of social media. So whereas once you had kind of a media establishment that was critical of these issues, offered critical viewpoints of it and wouldn't privilege the lunatics, you know, with space on the dial, with editorial access, right? With the most valuable real estate, like on an op-ed page. The reality is Facebook has no filters. And since it became widely available, I mean, you had the advent of the internet in the mid nineties, as it moved from an academic medium through the interface of the World Wide Web to a big public place. And, you know, we've seen this over years since there was dial-up service. We had on bulleted boards extremists trying to exploit that new technology. But then with the advent of Facebook, they could literally, and the, and the, the, the subsequent, you know, availability of the iPhone, the extremists capitalized on this dramatically. And they exploited the loopholes in the system created by bad laws like Section 230 to literally go at the jugular of our society and infect that kind of, um, what would you call it, like the public conversation with the poison of their prejudice. So again, I think you've got four factors that taken together have created the moment we're in right now. And it's, it's all very worrisome. The normalization of extremism, the application of intolerance through social media, the hardening of this, of the kind of economic, socioeconomic inequities, combined with this idea that the government that should be helping us is the enemy itself. It's a toxic combination, Roger. So Jonathan, when I was growing up, and again, I was born in the mid 50s. So I was a child during the 60s as the civil rights movement was happening. And people in my generation experienced an expansion of civil liberties, Mm. right? That a country that had historically had massive biases in favor of white men mm-hmm. was gradually letting more people into the party. And that, for most of my life, has felt like a process that would continue. Yet what you're describing, point one of your four points, is that we've now entered a period where it has become politically possible to take rights away from people. Yes. And that, it seems to me, is in some ways the most astonishing and frightening aspect of what's going on. Talk about that a little bit more, but also put in context the lack or the relative lack of pushback against that effort, that the institutions of democracy, our elected officials, and frankly, voters in general, have not resisted the removal of those rights in a way that one might have hoped. Yeah, I think it's a fair, it's a good observation in your part. And I think it's a very fair point. I think this country has been struggling with how to create a more perfect union, right, since its inception. But fundamental to that view, Roger, was the notion that we would continue to expand the franchise, meaning provide more access to the most valuable resource of resource of all, some would say, which is engagement in our democratic process. So it's giving women the right to vote, giving African Americans the right to vote, making it easier for you know immigrants to become citizens and participate in the franchise. That has been getting rid of poll taxes and other obstacles. That has been fundamental to the view of people, frankly, on all sides of the spectrum. So I think it's worth keeping in mind that neither side of the political you know, spectrum is exempt from ignorance or intolerance, right? So you had incumbents who used to be predominantly Democrats wanted to prevent African-Americans from being able to access all the privileges of being a part of this democracy. 
And then, as I was mentioning earlier, LB, after LBJ's momentous decision to support the Civil Rights Act, it shifted. So as a lot of those people became Republicans and still tried. But what's been really, I think, disturbing has been their, their very smart and strategic and really systematic way the incumbents have been pushing back on that and widening the enfranchisement and actually narrowing it again and again and again. And you see this in particular with the efforts to make it more difficult for people to vote. And you saw it in 2020, where they tried to re reduce the access um, to peop that people could get to the polls by reducing the hours or the availability of mail-in ballots, or even the availability of drop-off points for ballots. We saw that in places like Texas, you know, the ADL along with the N with the um, NAACP sued Governor Abbott in Texas on multiple times because of his very public efforts to restrict the vote. But what's really disturbing is that we didn't see a broad groundswell of popular discontent with these decisions on his part. And I make the point because, again, Governor Abbott happens to be a Republican, but 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, it was Democrats doing things like that. So I don't think this is about politics, Roger. I think this is about principles, right? I don't think this is a democratic issue. I think it's an issue of decency. And that's why it's so damning when people line up in lockstep against what seem like basic human principles of like accepting your fellow man as they are. And people who claim to be Christian or Jewish forgetting some of the most basic tenets of the Old and New Testament, which is about loving your fellow man. And yet somehow that's gone from being novel to being the norm, I think, for many people in politics today. Um, the ability, the fact that the, you know, and I'm also going to acknowledge, I think it's disturbing that the administration hasn't done more to prioritize some of these policies. I think we've got to see efforts to make, you know, the a renewal of the Voting Rights Act, that should be a number one priority for this president, for this administration. Now, I know it is important. I'm not trying to say they don't think it's important, but fundamental to so much of the change we need is simply ensuring that certain parties, small p, don't restrict, and it could be just one party with a big GOP, don't restrict the ability of people to vote because of the income they happen to draw, right? Or the way they ethnically might identify. I mean, I think it's really just shameful. Now, I know there are plenty of people in the GOP who are African-American who fall along the economic sector, and they would say, well, that's not what we're trying to do here. But make it harder for people, let's say working class people to vote, has a demonstrable impact on their ability to turn out and the ability for our elected, for our elections to actually rep fairly represent all segments of the populace. It simply does. So, for example, one of the propositions that's been proposed again and again is to not force people to vote only on Tuesdays, but to make it easier for people to vote, whether by absentee ballots or by going to the ballot box on any day. But, you know, again, certain parties, I think, have been very recalcitrant and hesitant to offer that kind of access because they're afraid. They're afraid of political repercussions today. But I think thinking only about yourselves in the short term, Roger, dooms all of us in the long term. It really does. So, two of the other issues, factors you talked about here are the mainstreaming of violence and hatred in the political spectrum and the role that internet platforms have played yeah. in doing that. Now, you and I got to know each other in the context of that exact issue, the right. Stop Hate for Profit, the real Facebook oversight board. So you have been a tireless uh, advocate for reform. Talk a little bit about how violence has become mainstreamed in American politics and the role that internet platforms have played both in doing that in effect also providing cover to the politicians who advocate for extreme positions. Wow. I mean, there is so much to talk about with regards to the role of the platforms in perpetuating not just this kind of, you know, bigotry and intolerance, but normalizing a kind of violence both rhetorical violence and real world violence. So I would say that if we try to identify why is anti-Semitism on the rise, why are conspiracy theories circulating with such velocity today? I mean, it does go back 
to social media. And Roger, again, you're you've you're a titan of Silicon Valley and Sand Hill Road. You know this space better than most. So I don't want to tell you things that you already know. But I think for the benefit of the audience, and I think this shouldn't be this should really be a dialogue between you and me because I think you have such depth and expertise on these issues. But the reality is that Americans today, particularly young people, they're not getting their news from cable television, let alone the New York Times. They're getting it from Twitter and TikTok. I mean, that should frighten all of us. But the reality is, is that Facebook, as I mentioned before, is almost like, you know, intravenously plugged into the veins of scores of millions of Americans. And so their unwillingness to challenge the the fictions that flow on their network. And in fact, the fact that they've their algorithms are engineered to amplify what clicks, right? Not necessarily what counts, but what clicks, because that's how their advertising model works, right? The most eyeballs and the most time, the most clicks creates the most revenue. And the lack of any liability for what they do and the inability of regulators to even understand how these platforms work has put us in this really precarious position today. So look, at the ADL, we track all this stuff. Like told, I mentioned before, we track hate offline. We're also tracking it online. We do an annual survey of online hate and harassment. And the data is damning. 41% in our last survey that we did in 2021, and we're doing another one right now, 41% of users of social media platforms report being victims of harassment at least once over the past 12, over the past year, over the past 12 months, having a serious experience with hate and harassment. 28%, 28% self-reported experiencing serious sustained harassment on these platforms. I mean, that is stunning. If we knew that one in four people on the subway were being harassed in public every time they got on public transportation. Or if one of four people crossing the street, say in midtown Manhattan, were being screamed at and harassed by their fellow pedestrians, you better believe there would be an outcry. And yet on social media, we've become so inured to it, there's little recoil, if at all. And the place, though, between TikTok and Twitter and YouTube and so many of these other platforms, where it happens most frequently, far and away, it's Facebook. So almost 75%, I think there's actually 77% of Facebook users report receiving hate and harassment on that platform versus something like 27% on Twitter, which was the second largest, the platform where the second most number of people said they were having issues. I mean, think about that. That isn't because Facebook is just the largest platform, and it is. It's because it is the wild, wild west in the worst possible way. And I will be the first to acknowledge social media has lots of upside. It connects people across cultures and continents. You can find your old high school classmate, or maybe you feel you don't have kind of friends in your local area. You can find some degree of community. There's no doubt about all of that. But I think we as a society need to look at these services, which have spread so much disinformation about simple things like science and COVID vaccines, leading to people being killed. And these services are live streaming, you know, literal violence, as we saw happen during the Christchurch shooting or during the El Paso shooting and so many others. I think the time is nigh when these companies seem constitutionally incapable of any degree, forget like self-regulation, just simple self-policing, right? Like if the mall, if Westfield or Simon Properties had a situation where their stores were regularly being robbed in broad daylight and their customers were being harassed while they walked into the food court, do you think that Simon or Westfield would just sit back? Of course they wouldn't, because they know they're liable and they're exposed to risk. 
And they can't afford that, neither reputationally, nor from a revenue perspective, nor regulatorily, if you will. So they would act. Literally, the only sector of our economy that is entirely shielded from the repercussions of their actions are these social media giants. And I think it is long overdue, long overdue for the government finally to engage. And we should talk about what the set of potential remedies are, Roger, because I think we need to go deep. And I can give you some specific things that I think need to happen and some macro stuff that I think needs to happen as well. Let's, Let's go there, Jonathan. All right. So I think specifically, there are some things that need to happen. First and foremost, you know, I sit here today with you as the CEO of the ADL, for God's sakes, we have been ferocious defenders of the First Amendment for over 100 years. This organization defended the right of Nazis to march in Skokie, as offensive as that may have been, because hard speech, even hateful speech, is the price you pay of living in a democracy. But there is something fundamentally different between freedom of expression and the freedom to incite violence against a specific class of users. There is something fundamentally different between freedom of speech and the freedom to slander people, okay, and spread lies about them. That is not protected speech under the First Amendment. And it wouldn't doesn't require you know a constitutional scholar to say there's something slightly different about it. So even though hard speech and hateful speech needs to be made available, it's the price again of our First Amendment. We don't have to sort of countenance the idea that our platforms, our media platforms, whether it's NBC or the New York Times or Facebook, should privilege those voices and put them front and center, like. That is a fiction that that's the First Amendment. It isn't. Like the white supremacists, they want to go have a conference. And they walk into the the local, I don't know, the local Marriott and say, we'd like to hold our annual conference here. The Marriott's going to say, you have every right to assemble, but why don't you assemble somewhere else? Because we have the right to deny you service. And if you know, the white supremacists submit an op-ed to the New York Times and say, we'd like to be heard. The New York Times has the right to say, well, you have the right to be heard, but maybe not in the New York Times, you know, Sunday review section. Go somewhere else. And Facebook has every right and Twitter and TikTok to say, you white supremacists, you want to be heard? Why don't you go somewhere else? Go to Getter or a parlor or wherever or Rumble and show it somewhere else because we don't want to service it. So I think number one, First and foremost, we should hold the platforms to a higher, higher, to a modicum of moral leadership. But then there are things we need to do to make sure if they won't do it themselves, the law needs to be changed. There should be no freedom of speech for algorithms. Bottom line, algorithmic amplification should be banned first and foremost. And you should be liable. If you're going to promote it, you should be responsible for it. You should stand by Okay, what you're willing to promote. If you're going to use your technological capital to serve something up, then you better be ready to you better ready to be used to your own financial capital if you will, to defend yourself in court. That's number one. Number two, I deeply believe we need to revisit these issues of anonymity. Like, look, there's no question that anonymity has done so much good for the alienated teen or the LGBTQ person who feels like they can't come out. Like, I believe in that and I appreciate that. But the cloak of anonymity has shielded, again, some of the worst possible actors, and that has got to go. So I believe in 230, you know, and the idea, if you will, in principle, but in practice, it doesn't work. And then number three, another tactical thing I think needs to happen, Roger, is I'm going to give you two more. Third one is we need to slow it down. Where is the natural law that says that when I Post something to my phone, it should be immediately broadcast for the whole world to see. Broadcast has a seven second delay. Talk radio has a delay. The internet needs a delay as well. I should not be able to live stream while I'm walking through a mosque, gunning people down to their death. It's disgusting. It's despicable. The company should be forced to use a delay. And then AI, you know, and machine learning can detect questionable content and delay it for, I don't know, an hour while it, while it gets a human scrub, I don't think that would be so hard. 
Don't tell me it's so hard. Hard is building a business that generates $30 billion a year in rep, a quarter, sorry, a year in revenue at a 24% net margin. That's hard. Uh, hard is a business that gets, I don't know, 3 billion users on it in 15 years. That's hard. You know what's not hard? Scrubbing the bad stuff with a little bit of human intervention. But the last thing I'll say on all of this front, I really think we need to revisit um, competition policy. I think it is long overdue. These businesses, any business that would say company over country, any business that would commit itself to, again, you know, breaking things and asking questions later, that should raise all of our concern. And these companies are now simply too big, as they say, too big to fail, but they're not too big to be regulated. They are public hazards that need to be governed with the same attention we give to certain utilities. And um, I think until we rein them in, we're all going to be sorting through the wreckage that they leave behind. So I, I really think that that's something that needs to be considered. And then finally, you know, like I've, we, you and I have talked about this very specifically too. We've seen this model like with big tobacco. The companies are creating, they offer a kind of moral hazard. They're leaving so much wreckage in their wake. We should force them to use their funds to pay for the public health damage they're doing. Imagine like the big tech fund, if Facebook and Google and these other companies gave 1% of their top line, 1%. So I don't know what Facebook's 1% will be this year alone. I'm going to guess, Roger, it's going to be probably, I mean, for sorry, for uh, let's say for 2022, probably about 120 billion top line, something like that, would you guess? Maybe a little bit more. So the companies and Google, you know, and Twitter should be putting one. If you get, if you benefit from two thirty protections, you should put one percent of your revenue toward helping society repair and uh, heal from that two thirty protection, like a big tech fund that would make it easier to help the victims of harassment, that would fund public education campaigns. Long overdue. So, I want to take a. a a question here from the audience because I think right. this is a this is a really core thing. What can each and every person who's listening to you now? That's a great question. Age in this, how can they become part of the solution? Because it isn't just internet platforms that are causing no. the harm here. Obviously, our elected officials are not acting, and yes. other voters are not engaging actively enough. What give us your your list? I mean, obviously, start by reading. It could happen here. That's right. the you know, well, that's this. That is I'm a good serious. place to start. This book is, in fact, a how to for each and every one of us. So I would encourage everyone to read it first. But Jonathan, take us away. Yeah, look, I mean, I literally wrote the book to share ADL strategies and tactics and tips over the last hundred years. How do you fight hate? But I'll, I'll give you three ideas, Roger. Number one, we've all got to call out hate when it happens. This is really important. Like, I think for too long, we've thought, ah, ignore that crazy uncle. Ah, ignore that guy at the water cooler. Ah, ignore that person in the locker room. But the reality is, is we have to interrupt intolerance when it happens and help the person on the other side realize it's not okay. And that may seem small, but it actually looms large, especially when you're an ally to others. So I think calling out hate when it happens, whether it's flagging that post on Facebook or, again, interrupting someone when they're making a kind of offensive joke or an offensive comment. I think that's really important. Um, and that starts, all of us can do that. All of us have the power to find a little bit of courage and to call it out. That's number one. Number two, we need to cancel, cancel culture entirely. I also think this is really important because the kind of extremism on the right, which is violent, there's also an illiberalism on the left which certainly isn't as physically violent, but threatens to curtail kind of free speech as well. We see this on our college campuses and we see this in many of our sort of like press rooms and it's also ugly and it's also untoward. So I think we need to remember, at least my Jewish faith teaches me that everyone has the power to be redeemed. Everyone can acknowledge an error and apologize and do better. None of us are born perfect. All of us need to be on kind of a path of self-improvement all the time. And so I think number one 
is calling out hate when it happens. Number two is canceling cancel culture and giving people the opportunity to, again, apologize and redeem themselves. I think that's really important, too. And I don't mean, you know, to commit in some kind of like, you know, communist party style struggle session, but it's accepting people as who they are and understanding their fallibility. And then number three, you know, look, Roger, I feel very strongly about this. And I write in the book about this. I think democracy is not something you can watch, you know, from the cheap seats and the bleachers with popcorn and just hope that it all works out. Or you can sort of be a spectator on social media. Democracy is a contact sport and you got to get on the field and play. That might mean, you know, volunteering. That might mean voting. That might mean serving in some way, like, like running for office, whether that's literally dog catcher or a school board or an election, you know, election office. But this is so important. Civil society, again, isn't, didn't come together through spontaneous combustion, right? The reality is our democracy isn't those big, like, you know, neo-ionic buildings in um, D.C. Our democracy are all the small little things that are knitted together by a set of values and principles. And if we don't participate, if we are so, you know, uh, anesthetized by our Facebook feed that we fail to realize that we are the ones we've been waiting for, as the expression goes, then we risk all of this falling apart. So again, I would say, stop hate when it happens, cancel, cancel culture, and kind of embrace the humanity of your fellow humans. And thirdly, you know, get in it. You got to be in it to win it. So it, another audience question. So what is the role of government in all of this? Well, I think government is crucial. I mean, I think we need to recognize, and I think to see the costs of gridlock, it's more important than it's more obvious to me than ever before. But I just don't believe those who say the government is the enemy. I don't think that at all. I don't think government is our savior. I don't think government is our enemy. I think government falls in the middle. But government, we should all remember, is us, right? It is we, the people, by the people, for the people. We are the government. So we need to get involved, whether it's at not that doesn't mean you need to run for Congress, for goodness sakes, but at the county, at the local level, everybody has a part to play. I would hope this was something that you learned, I don't know, in student council as a middle schooler. But if somehow you miss that lesson, like just look at, um, you know, what many who have observed American democracy have said over the centuries, it's these little things that come together that make us whole. So what's government's role? You're really asking what's our role? And I think we've got to take an active, we've got to play an active role in shaping our own future. Sorry, shaping our own present. If we want to have the kind of future we'd like to leave to our children and grandchildren. And so does that require each and every one of us then to get more engaged in the political process? Should they be calling their member of Congress? Should they be you know, joining an indivisible group? What's the, you know, yeah. joining ADL? To get, what are some of the paths? What are, you know, I think people need some options and some sure. guidance. So I think when I talk about volunteering, that could be getting involved with your local. By the way, let's be clear about one thing. Like the ADL is a 501c3 nonpartisan organization. So I don't really care how you vote. I care what you value, right? So if you want to get involved with the GOP or the Democratic Party or your local Green Party or whatnot, get involved. So volunteer, show up and register people to vote, show up like at an event, like, again, participate in your local democracy. Number two, volunteer for an NGO. Again, civic society is not all politics. It's Girl Scouts and it's Rotary Clubs and it's groups like the ADL. Get involved and volunteer. Again, it's these little interactions, these micro moments that taken together make up the stuff of our societies, and we shouldn't lose sight of that. So number three, like if you don't want to volunteer and you don't want to show up, you can be involved in other ways too. You can donate to groups that you care about. You can make phone calls to your local member of Congress, your local member of you know, your city council. You can show up at meetings without having to volunteer and just be there and be present and persuade your democracy that way. Um, you can sign petitions. You can do things online. Like, I don't believe in slacktivism, if you will. 
as an alternative to activism, but everybody needs to get involved and calibrate in a way that makes sense for them as an individual. And hopefully it's a, hopefully democracy should be a gateway drug that will stimulate you to want to do more and more. And so when you, what you're describing then is we want to remind ourselves of our community, of our shared values, of the benefits of collective action. Because in a sense, what you're describing as the problem is the sense that each one of us is on our own. And therefore, it's a zero sum or negative sum game because we're competing against literally everyone else. Yeah. I mean, in many ways, you know, Bob Putnam wrote this really important book in the 90s called Bowling Alone, which is about how we were seeing civic life disintegrate. And I think in many ways, like the twin vectors of Amazon helping to accelerate Walmart's killing of local retail, plus, you know, Google and Facebook's decimating local media have destroyed kind of the local core that held our communities together. But truly, to your point, Roger, life is not a zero sum game. It never was and it never will be. It is literally the sustained game that we are all have a vested interest to continue to play which is why if you care about community and you care about, again, our shared civic fabric, you want to leave that to your children, grandchildren, you've got to roll up your sleeves and get involved. And it's not about being a Republican or a Democrat. It's about being having a degree of decency and having a degree of humanism toward your, toward your fellow men and women. I just think it's never been more important than it is today. One of the things I'm always struck by when I talk to you or when I read your book is I'm always reminded of the great Martin Lee Miller poem, right? First, they came for the socialists, but I said nothing because right. I was not a socialist. And it seems to me that this is a moment in time where a majority of Americans are being singled out by someone for being other. Yep. It applies essentially to all women because rights are being taken away from women, all people of color because rights are being taken away from people of color, people with any uh, non- cis sexual orientation are being persecuted. And you add that up and it's to a, a meaningful majority of all Americans. And yet we are in this place where we do not have a sense of community, a sense of shared value. And I'm, you know, as, as we come to our last few minutes here, I wonder if you could distill all of that in your own thoughts about what the path is for, because the stakes that you're describing are essentially, you know, people don't seem to internalize how dangerous this is for all of us. Yeah. I mean, again, I think it's Jews who have sort of roughly 2000 years of history of persecution, where every, you know, every country in which Jews live, they lived in diaspora, right? When they were expelled out of Eretz Yisrael, uh, literally in every country, their sojourn ended in like it ended in marginalization, forced conversion, expulsion, or persecution leading to death. Like that's how it went in every place until this one, and maybe a couple others like Canada and Australia haven't quite gone that way. Um, but so I think our antenna, Jews have a kind of genetically, you know, the trauma they say is passed can be passed down, if you will, like epigenically. And so I think Jews have a collective antenna that's alert to threats. I just think so. And I think today, this otherization, we're familiar with this, Roger. We've seen this movie before. And again, whether it's being cast on, you know, Asian, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, or Mexican and people who identify as Latino, or African Americans, or people who present as black. I mean, I think all of this is so dangerous. And so I think at the local level, again, all of us have the, have the power to participate, have an ability to engage, and you have to find the way that it works for you, whether it's stopping hate when it happens or showing up at that school board meeting, all of us need to get engaged. Then I think at the macro level, um, I think we need both reform as it relates to social media, which continues to pump this poison into our collective consciousness without any you know, abatement. And it's really scary. You also do need some political reform. We haven't really talked about that. We need, again, 
re voting reform. I think we need to think about filibuster reform. And you can even look at SCOTUS reform, uh, term limits, and maybe even expanding the number of justices. I think to get to a more perfect union, we need more dynamism and less uh, stasis in our political system, constructive dynamism. And I think it's certainly possible. And again, today, Democrats may feel like they're being marginalized. Down the road, it could be Republicans. I mean, all of us as citizens benefit from a, from a system that is open and fair and decent. I really believe that. So, Well, one of the things that I find most troubling is that we are in a pandemic that has killed more than 800,000 Americans in which, you know, by all historical precedent, we that should have been an element that brought us together. Yes. Right. And gave us a shared enemy and a shared ambition and shared goal. And yet we have missed that. And I find that, you know, in the context of your book, I find that terrifying because there are there's only one other thing besides a pandemic that generally brings people together, and that's war. Yeah. And if a pandemic doesn't do it, that's that should give us all grave concern. Yeah, I mean, look, I don't know if we ever would have cured polio or smallpox if we'd had Facebook in those eras. And so, again, I think if we try to understand why are we still so divided, you know, the disinformation, whether it's Russians Russian agents or Iranian agents or whomever that they're putting into our, you know, into our media to try to distract us. That kind of stuff has always been there, but never before have they had access to, you know, 330 million Americans thanks to these devices. And so indeed, the lack of cohesion after COVID-19 is scary. The anti-science contingent in our country is nuts. Um, and I think it's deeply worrying. So I don't know how we write this wrong, Roger. I don't know how we get this right unless we tackle the, sh the threat of social media once and for all. We engage in some political reform and every person accepts and recognizes their individual responsibility to do better. Well, Jonathan, I think that's a extraordinarily good place for us to close. I mean, sadly, I, I could go on all day because... <laughs> I mean, ladies and gentlemen, you are in the presence here of one of the great leaders in our culture today. And uh, Jonathan has written this book. It could happen here. Please read it. Please. I think one of the things you can do is give it to everyone you know. You know, Jonathan comes at this from uh, the perspective of the ADL, which has a history. But it part of that history is representing all Americans and everyone, irrespective of where they come from or what they look like or what they believe. And, you know, what I would ask you to do is buy the book and communicate this to everybody you know. This program and others like it will soon be found on the Commonwealth Club's website, which is www.commonwealthclub.org. Please be sure to pick up a copy of Jonathan's book, It Could Happen Here, Why America is Tipping from Hate to the Unthinkable and How We Can Stop It wherever books are sold, particularly if you can buy it at an independent bookstore or on a, a bookshop.org, that would be great. I am Roger McNamee, and this Commonwealth Club program is now adjourned.